you know, the, the interesting part is when I, when I was leaving Yahoo, uh, a senior vice president there pulled me aside and, you know, he told me that I was making a huge mistake that Facebook <laughs> wasn't going to go anywhere. And um, I, I decided to follow my gut. For our second tech track, I'm talking with Girish today, who is a mentor who I've known for several years now. Girish is a 10-year Facebook veteran who was with the company as it grew from around 400 people to more than 40,000 people. So among the many, many things he did at Facebook, he helped start the Facebook London office, which now has thousands of people. He led the company-wide new hire onboarding program called Bootcamp. And he also managed several teams across multiple stacks and platforms. Garish left Facebook in 2019, and he now leads infrastructure engineering at the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, which is an organization created by Priscilla Chan and Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg to advance human potential and promote equality. So thank you, Garish, for joining us. And I thought actually it would be interesting to talk about how we met, which was more than three years ago. So I was leaving my previous job at Pinterest and I had offers from Snapchat and Facebook, right? And yep. it came down to basically those two companies. And I, that's, how, that's how we met uh, through the recruiting process. And so I remember we must have talked on the phone for four or five hours across multiple conversations. Yep. And I, uh, I'm just really grateful that we were able to connect that way because I just remember hearing you talk about why you had been at Facebook for so long. At, at that point, you had already been there for more than eight years. And what kept you there? And how do you think about a decision like that? I was pretty nervous about it. And of course, I ended up picking Facebook. We worked pretty closely together at Facebook. And that's really what led to us having this conversation today. So yeah. I just wanted to say thank you for, for that. It was a big impact on my career. Well, that's, that's really good to hear. And it was uh, it's great working with you while we did. We, we did work together for quite a while, about two and a half years. But then in 2019, like I mentioned in the intro, you actually left Facebook to join CZI, the Chan Zuckerberg yeah. Initiative. And so maybe we could start there. Can you talk about sure. what is the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative and what do you do there? Yeah. So like you mentioned in your intro, the Chan Zuckerberg Initiative uh, was started by Priscilla Chan and Mark Zuckerberg. Uh, and the way they started this organization is really after their birth of their first child, Max. Uh, so they decided that Max should have a you know same future or better future than what they had. So they decided to contribute 99% of their fortune, their wealth to uh, the initiative, and they continue to do so. So it's a philanthropic in it, um, organization, and it really encompasses a wide variety of um, you know, areas that we cover. Um, the three main initiatives are education, science, and justice opportunity. And each of those initiatives have really ambitious goals. So for example, the science initiative, one of the goals they have is to cure or manage all diseases by the end of the century. Mm. And so we have about, you know, 80 years to go figure this out. And obviously we, at the initiative, don't hire doctors or, um, you know, we don't have labs and those types of things. What we do is we help other organizations through giving money and also through building software. So about one third of the company is really uh, a tech startup. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating organization because it's a mix of tech as well as uh, philanthropy. And what I do there is I lead the infrastructure engineering team, which really cuts across all these three initiatives and really helps uh, teams across the board. So we have software teams in each initiative and it helps these teams uh, minimize reinventing the wheel by creating a set of common platforms, tooling, and practices that we can put in place to really further uh, their goals and their products quicker. So getting started faster and scaling better. I wanna talk about how did you make that decision? So you were at Facebook for more than 10 years and you decide at some point, of course, okay, like I want to try out something new. So how did you think about uh, the different options? You probably had tons of options, right? After leaving Facebook, how did you decide on CZI in particular? Yeah, the funny thing is I didn't, you know, obviously I, I do get approached by other companies um, to you know, join them, but 
I actually didn't look anywhere else. Uh, I picked mm. CDI for a very specific purpose. Um, when I, you know, I, I joined Facebook when it was very small, you know, less than 500 employees. And later on, you know, when we, when I left, it was in the tens of thousands closer to, you know, 40 plus thousand employees. And for me, you know, I, I think, you know, it's a great company, uh, but the j job I was doing there and the, the role I had, uh, it just felt like a small, small part of this large company. Whereas I wanted uh, to do something with a little bit more leverage across the company, you know, having an impact on the whole company. So that's one of the reasons I, I went for a smaller firm. The other thing is, you know, I feel that I got pretty lucky in my life, um, joining Facebook so early and just, you know, having good fortune um, that I wanted my next job to be uh, on the philanthropic side. I wanted to give back. Uh, and, you know, given my skill set of building large engineering teams, it's not really, uh, I can't really walk into a, a nonprofit and say, okay, guys, you know, let's go build a software engineering team. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not that many philanthropic institutions that are intersection of technology and um, philanthropy. So CGI just fit the bill really well there. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's that perfect mixture and it felt like the right spot for me to be. And so I approached, um, I approached them and I said, Hey, I'd like to interview. Um, you know, it's fascinating because a lot of people think that CZI is a part of Facebook just because, you know, Mark and Priscilla, uh, run it. And that's not true at all. It, you know, I had to quit my job at Facebook, uh, leave all that stuff behind and then, go to CZI interview and get a brand new offer with a different set of benefits and a different yeah. pay and all those things. Yeah, that, that makes sense. And I feel like for a lot of people watching, Chan Zuckerberg is an amazing combination of really deep tech and solving hard technical problems along with the social good aspect, which yeah. is really compelling. Um, at the same time, Facebook is inherently a social product, right? Yeah. And Facebook is well known for internal mobility. So did you think about that at all? As you were coming up on almost 11 years at Facebook, there are a ton of teams, I think, at Facebook that do social good work as well. Yeah. How did you think about that? Yeah, that's absolutely right. Um, I think, again, it comes back to my original point about going to something small, mm. uh, right? Like Facebook, I think it has a ton of opportunity and an amazing place to grow a career. And like I mentioned, I, you know, or you mentioned, I, I spent a lot of my career there. It's the longest job I've ever had. Yeah. And um, it, at the end of the day, I wanted to go back to a smaller company. And I've, I've done this pattern a few times, uh, even at Facebook. Um, so uh, as you noted in my introduction, I did move my entire family to London in 2012 uh, to go start the London office. And when I got there, I was the first engineering manager there. And there were about five uh, engineers. Mm -hmm. So... It, it started out pretty small. And when I left London uh, a year and a half or so later, uh, it was closer to 120 to 150. And then now it's in the thousands. And so I, I always have liked, you know, going from uh, or finding the smaller teams within a large company too. So the, the move to a smaller company made a lot of sense in my head. That makes a lot of sense. I'm really interested in your journey at Facebook. Sure. Um, and I think people forget that, you know, Facebook is a huge company now. It obviously wasn't that way for, for forever. Um, it actually grew very, very quickly. So 2008, you interview at Facebook, you end up joining. Can you paint the land? Can you describe the landscape for us? Paint the picture for us of who are the competitors? What were you doing at the time? You were at Yahoo, I think. Talk yeah. about uh, what that decision was like. Yeah, it was, it was very interesting. So Yahoo, again, you know, I had the same feeling of being a small part of a large company, uh, even though I did work on tools and I interacted with the leadership quite a bit, I wanted something a little bit smaller where I could have a lot more impact. And so when I made the decision to look around, I was looking at startups and smaller companies and Facebook really stood out as where, you know, where my friends that I really respected were going. So I decided to interview with them. 
And when I did, I, you know, my entire team interviewed me and I just, you know, I just really uh, respected the interviewers and I kind of uh, got really attracted to the team itself. And, but what team was that, by the way? Uh, what was it called I, back then? It was called technical operations back then. Uh, so it was a team that uh, built infrastructure at Facebook. Uh, a lot of the, we, 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 you know, we monitored servers, we monitored the Facebook site um, and, you know, responded to incidents and things like that. Um, and, you know, the, the interesting part is when I, when I was leaving Yahoo, uh, a senior vice president there pulled me aside and, you know, he told me that I was making a huge mistake that Facebook <laughs> wasn't going to go anywhere. And um, I, I decided to follow my gut. You know, like the company Facebook that I was talking to seemed to have really smart people who were very passionate about what they were doing. And they seem to have that right attitude of, you know, like this is a product I want to work on. This is a product I want to build. And if you remember back, back in 2008, Facebook was up until then very restricted. Uh, it was only open to s some businesses like big uh, companies and mostly colleges, universities actually. And, uh, but the, the way the Facebook product was being built, it really enabled people to connect to each other. And that, that was the most attractive part for me was just being able to, you know, talk to my, well, my, you know, college friends who are now distributed all over the country. And, you know, I had a Facebook account back, I think in 2006. Uh, so I knew the product pretty well. And I was, uh, I was just fascinated by the company. And how does that work? Because in 08, it was still restricted to college students and high school students, I think. So how, how did you get the account? Because you graduated from college a bit earlier, right? How did that work? Right. So uh, I graduated from UC Santa Barbara, and they actually keep uh, my alias active. They forwarded oh. it to a personal email alias. So nice. I still have my old Garish at, you know, cs.ucsv.edu address uh, that I can use. Um, I try not to abuse it, uh, but <laughs> this is one of the cases where I went, I, I got to try this out um, and I have to try it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, going back to your landscape question, when I came in to Facebook, uh, the competitors were really different from what they are today. Right. You know, we, you know, MySpace was still much bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, Go Google bought this company called Orchid. Uh, which was also very big, especially outside the U.S., uh, in India and other countries. And each of the regions of the world had this fragmented uh, social network. But, you know, China had their own. Uh, you know, South America had a different one. And then, you know, India obviously had Orchid and the U.S. had MySpace. So uh, the, the industry was fairly fragmented. And, you know, it, it, I felt like, Facebook at the end of the day ended up, you know, unifying a lot of this because of its, of its quality of the product. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, you know, the, the engineers that built the product paid really close attention to uh, the user experience and uh, also brought in the mixed media, you know, including photos, chat and video to the experience that really helped connect it to folks that use the product today, which is everyone. It sounds like you were really impressed with the engineers in that interview process. Was it primarily the technical acumen that you just thought that the Facebook engineering team was way better than the engineering team at MySpace or Orca? Or was it like that along with product direction, along with design skill? Like what, what exactly did you think made Facebook so much better than uh, the other no, competitors? I, I, well, they were judging me, so I couldn't judge their technical skills. So that was mm. not one of the reasons. It was, you know, during the interview, you are entering the company just as much as they're interviewing you, right? You want to know how do you fit in? Like, can you work with these people eight, 12, I don't know how many hours a day yeah. uh, that you need to. And uh, you want to get a sense of how this team is going to be. And when I was entering with them, you know, the way they conducted the interview, the, uh, the, 
the process of the interview, the candidate experience, all kind of plays into uh, my decision on picking that company. It, it, it was a, you know, the, the team that interviewed me, I got to ask them questions and really try to figure out if these are the folks that I could work with day in and day out. And, you know, the great part is even to this day, I'm friends with most of them and I still, you know, catch up with them and I would work with them again anytime. That's the really interesting point. So you have this very compressed period, a couple hours to assess if these are people that you want to work with day in, day out for, you know, in your case, 10 years or more. So what advice do you have for quickly vetting or assessing if you would want to work with people in an interview or outside of interview? Yeah, I think it, you're right. It is very compressed, uh, but I do think you can rely on your gut to get a fairly good sense of how that company is going to be. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've interviewed at other places where I've been less than impressed with the teams there uh, that, you know, I just walked away from. Uh, so definitely I would suggest that, you know, your audience trust their gut when they're selecting their next job. Okay. Are there particular questions that help you like get, give your gut that direction or is it just like you kind of gauge the conversation high level and make, make a decision? In general, I think it's high level. I, I would ask questions such as, you know, I, I think it really depends on how big the company is. It's, it's, it's a situation uh, based question. So for example, if I was going into a bigger company, uh, I would ask questions more around, you know, what are the opportunities for me growing myself? Like, you yeah. know, what other uh, ways can I grow my career rather than just sitting there coding all the time? Uh, for a smaller company, I, I think the, you know, you ask questions about, you know, like what's been interesting, what kind of interesting problems are you working at? Because, uh, the issues with smaller companies is that, you know, you're going to get there and you're going to get a different role than what you think you have. Mm -hmm. And what you really want to do is suss out, uh, what stage are they in? Are they, are they just sitting there doing everything manually or mm -hmm. are they in a, at a good spot where things are much more automated and you will get to do more exciting things rather than sit there and, you know, do manual tasks. And uh, a lot of those factors, I think, you know, it's, it's really hard for a, a person coming out of college to really assess that without having worked anywhere before. But, uh, you know, for them, I think a good, good question might be just to see how the interviewers like their jobs. You know, like it, it's, it's a very simple question of like, you know, what do you do that's, you know, in your day to day that's that you like a lot, that's fun. Uh, and see what kind of answers you get. And you will see how stressed out they are and how, yeah. um, how much they enjoy their work. And you know, like what you want to do is you want to get up in the morning and be excited to go to work and not dread you know, that alarm going off and you having to roll out of bed and drag yourself around. Like that's yeah. not the position you want to be in. Yeah, what I've heard is I think that's super helpful, asking people what they love about their job. The opposite is also really valuable, right? And what I've done a lot is what do you hate about your job? What do you dislike the most? And then that's also very illuminating to, to hear uh, what do people not like and can you live with that fact? Yeah, absolutely. And I think uh, the other thing that would bring out is how transparent they are. You, know, mm. uh, you want transparency in your team. You want to be able to trust them and you want them to be able to show you the good and the bad rather than kind of, you know, shield you from the bad before you get there and switch it on you. Makes sense. Um, I have one more question before we dive into your actual experience at Facebook. Um, <clears throat> even starting in 08, I think from the very beginning of Facebook, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's always been this kind of Mark Zuckerberg at the center of the company. And, you know, that often gets critiqued in Silicon Valley, how we have maybe one founder who is basically a god in the company. And I think that was obvious in 08, and it's still very much the case today in 2020. So did that weigh on you at all? How did you think about, you know, Mark Zuckerberg having so much control of Facebook in 08 and even now versus joining a company which might be more egalitarian? I don't know if that's the right word, but, you know, more kind of uh, 
evenly distributed power? Yeah, I, you know, I, I didn't get a chance to meet Mark during my interview process. Um, I met him on at my first week, but ever since, ever since the start, I, I, I really believed in just kind of Mark's perspective, right? And how he sees his product play out. Uh, since the beginning, he all he wanted to do was connect people. And if you if you think about Facebook in 2008, uh, we weren't as commercialized. Mark wasn't, you know, the the marketing person that uh, you know leads to a big company. Mark hired a really good uh, support structure underneath him. So starting from you know Cheryl Sandberg uh, and uh, Shrep, Mike, um, who runs the engineering team, uh, Chris Crox, who ran, you know, dealt the product. So Yeah, so Chris, I think, joined um, in 06, right? He was super early. Right. And then right. Cheryl Sandberg, the COO, and Mike Shrepp for the CTO, sounds like they joined a little bit after you. Yep. Wow, so you, yeah, you were super early. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, it's, I remember Cheryl joining and the announcement going through. And, you know, right after, well, or a couple months after Cheryl joined, you could start seeing uh, the influence that she was having through the company. So it's definitely not a one person, you know, who's God at the company. You know, it's, it's really interesting because if you've, you know, you've worked at the company, but you know, you can also see it in our public Q and A's and things like that uh, people hold Mark uh, accountable for different things. He's not allowed to get away with things. People ask him very hard questions and uh, inside the company, I don't see that same persona that I see in the press or uh, I see, you know, elsewhere, uh, including, you know, the, the movies. So uh, definitely in the media, Mark is painted a different light than I feel the company has uh, internalized for itself. It's not a fair characterization to say that his power is unchecked. Like he has a team of really smart people around him and his employees and the press to some extent that keep him, keep him accountable. Is that right? Yeah. I, I think Mark has surrounded himself with really capable and smart people and he's not afraid of them challenging him and he welcomes that challenge. And I see this on a regular basis, even at the Chan Zuckerberg initiative, Priscilla and Mark, you know, I get to ask them questions on a regular basis. And uh, I think that's what, really brings uh, a balance to the company because you, you, you want that feedback as a CEO. You want your employees to tell you, uh, you know, what they're feeling, what's, what's going on at the, at the, at the lower levels of the company because it, it helps you make better decisions from, you know, from your vantage point. Can we talk about now your actual tenure at Facebook? And I want to partition it into a couple of different segments. One is your pre-London time, which is 2008 to 2012. Then you spent a few years in London, and then you came back and you did a couple other teams uh, in 2014 up until 2019, right? Yep. Um, so I think 08 to 2012, that was like hyper growth, Facebook taking over the world, very positive attention on Facebook in the US at least. So can yep. you talk about that period in particular and what you learned or any good, ex any good stories you can share? <laughs> yeah, plenty. Um, I yeah, when I joined Facebook, um, it was very scrappy of a company. You know? Like engineers, you know, we we had experienced engineers and we had engineers just out of college. And the great thing about a Facebook engineering team and the engineering culture is we don't um, we give everyone kind of the opportunity to prove themselves out and to present ideas. Uh, we have these things called hackathons uh, that uh, generate a lot of ideas from anyone in the company and bring them forward. And a lot of our products, uh, you know, even now probably uh, were created through hackathons. You know, like if you, if you kind of look back, the chat, the like button, newsfeed, all of these things were small projects that started in hackathon that kind of blossomed into uh, the product we are, we know today. And 
when I was, you know, during those those years, I was uh, the primary release engineer for Facebook. So I helped build the tooling that shipped the site uh, every day. Uh, and anytime the site went down, I I was one of the people on call. So I I remember many times, you know, the, the team calling me going, hey guys, I, or hey Garish, the, the site is down. Uh, can you help? What do we do? And or you analyze the situation and you, you figure out, is this really risking pushing the site? Because anytime you change anything on such a massive scale, mm-hmm. uh, you don't know what else you're going to break. Yeah, so, I'm curious, how, uh, how often do things break? Like, you know, I mean, that, that, that poster in Facebook is famous, where back then they had a poster saying, move fast and break things. And they've since deprecated that and they don't want to break things as much anymore. But back then, I'm curious, how often did things go down? I, I don't think they went down as much as I felt they did. Because externally, I okay. feel like it wasn't as prevalent. Because, you know, there was definitely the uh, Twitter's fail whale meme um, that we somehow avoided, you know, Phil, Twitter was known as the, the company would always have this error page with the whale. Um, and, you know, it, it definitely broke a, a few times, uh, and massively a couple of times, like just a handful, but most of the time, you know, it was smaller parts of the site that would break. Uh, the interesting part of my job there was, uh, we responded to a few different types of issues very seriously. Uh, and a lot of them involved privacy and security. So anytime uh, there was a data leak, a privacy leak. So for example, uh, if a user could see something they weren't supposed to accidentally, uh, that would be an immediate reaction. And we needed that fixed as soon as possible. And we would work around the clock. Um, and I remember, you know, I was about to fly uh, to meet my uh, wife in New York and I was at the airport going about to go to the scanners and I got a call and I kind of answered the call and I say, Hey, what's going on? And they're like, Hey, the site is down. We need your help. And I remember putting the phone down. It, st- it was still connected. I went through the x-ray machine. I walked through, go to the other side, pick up the phone. And I said, okay, let me get on my laptop now. And at the airport, I got on the laptop and I decided, this was serious enough where I had to skip the flight. Oh, wow. And I ended up not flying. Um, instead, I ended up coming back to work, fixing the problem, and then uh, flew out the next day. Uh, so, yeah, it is, it is um, something that release engineers just take seriously. Uh, mm-hmm. when, even when it's not visible to anyone, even if it's just one person who has uh, this issue, we will uh, resolve it. Right. Yeah, it, it, it's it's a privacy issue is just you know as serious as a, a security incident. And can and real quick, can we just briefly talk about what is release engineering? Because I think a lot of people know software engineering, and there's interesting yeah. interesting dynamic between software engineers who like you know write the code to build different features, and that pay, code basically gets thrown over a wall or it go, goes through some process, and then the release engineer has the responsibility now to get that out to the millions or even billions of people who might use that feature or that code. So can you talk yeah. about, uh, you know, that dynamic and what exactly does a release engineer do? Yeah. So release engineering has definitely changed in the last probably couple of decades and has evolved. Um, so back when, um, you know, you had desktop software, you would have these really long, what they call release cycles. So when software versions get updated. So uh, if you want to think of your operating system, for example, is one good example of that. And it, even to this day, you don't get updates to your operating system every day. You get them mm. once uh, in a while. And if it's a security fix, you get it right away. But, you know, for major updates, they wait a year or two. Um, release engineering at a company like Facebook is much more frequent. Uh, today, they release continuously throughout the day, every day, 24 hours a day. Uh, but back in 2008, 2009, we released every day. and uh, the interesting uh, thing about the Facebook engineering culture is, you know, like you mentioned, uh, in many places, engineers end up writing code and throwing it over the wall. At Facebook, that was not the case. Hmm. Uh, engineers had to shepherd their change all the way through the release process. So 
every day my job was, well, I, I automated a lot of this stuff out. So I made, you know, bots and uh, these are just automated systems that account for how engineers are checking their code and things like that. And uh, so it's engineers would come in and say, hey, I have a set of changes that I would like to release to the world. Uh, you know, bot, robot, can you help me? And, you know, they submitted the change. The release engineer would look at all the changes and see if there's any particularly risky ones um, that we might not want to ship that day um, based on, you know, the, the, the product that is touching and things like that. And then we ended up selecting the ones that we did ship. And most of the time we shipped them all um, and would call on the engineers to make sure they checked it. So there's a process that you go through where you push, push this change out to a few dozen servers and have... Uh, engineers go test it themselves and make sure it works, either run their test scripts or uh, just visually check things and make sure everything is fine. And then you slowly release it to the world. Hmm. Uh, the interesting and and by the way, that, we're talking only about releasing the web version of Facebook, right? Like back then, yeah. everyone today uses the Android or iOS app for Facebook. Back, there yes. was no app back then, right? So right. That's, that's a little bit different, right? You're talking about releasing a website versus releasing yeah. a mobile so app. Back until about 2011, um, smartphones weren't a big thing. Yeah, right? that's wild to think and, about how quickly that changes. Right, and uh, up until then, you know, we mainly talked about releasing on uh, on the web platform. Uh, to this day, I think the web, you know, when I when I talk about releases going out continuously, I am talking about the web website, which is still heavily used, uh, and also it is the backing of the Android app. Mm. Right, so your Android app has to connect to something. And it's connecting the website using APIs and you know, all of those things. Uh, so those changes are still just as uh, just as risky because you if you if you ch- you know push an API change that's a breaking change, you are going to break those billions of you know customers. Uh, but yeah, back back then uh, the website uh, used to get pushed every day, like I mentioned, and. The interesting part is during my tenure there, uh, the technology we used behind the website, we used to use Apache uh, as a web server, which is very popular and open source um, web server uh, and ran PHP. But in 2009, uh, we started building this thing called uh, hip hop, uh, which is uh, uh, back then what it did is it converted all PHP code to C++ compiled it and created this C++ binary that contained a web server in it and that ran on all our web servers. Uh, so part of my job during that time, one of the, the biggest accomplishments that I had was uh, moving facebook.com from running Apache and PHP to uh, this C++ uh, light, you know, binary file, which was built out, you know, through that via that PHP code. And uh, the interesting thing there was, you know, the release of PHP is very easy. You you just kind of change a few PHP files uh, on each server and you're like, okay, that's done. So we had about 10,000 servers or, you know, 20,000 servers. I don't remember at the time. And you just go through and change the PHP file on there and you were done. And that was the release process. You know, maybe a megabyte at the most of files were changing. Uh, when it went to C++, the problem was, you had to swap out that entire binary. So mm. we had to make sure we got a gigabyte and a half, 1.5 gigabytes of binary onto each of the machines and swap it out uh, without bringing the site down. Because that's the other interesting part about the, the website is it never goes down. Yeah. So we don't do this. We're down for maintenance, guys. Come back later. Um, notice, like, you know, it just doesn't happen. It's it's all done transparently in the background while you're um, while you're still serving customers. So uh, it's really important to make sure that you know users who are connected to the website could get multiple versions of the software. And so your software needs to be backwards and forwards compatible uh, when you're yeah, designing it. I, I'm really curious about that because you said hip hop was introduced in '09, right? Yeah. And then Facebook also essentially invented a new language, which was a derivative of PHP called Hack, right? What year was that? 2011? So I think that started, Hack really started 
the, the beginnings probably started in 2011. Okay. Um, but we started publishing things probably 2012, around that time. Okay. And uh, so I think, Mike, my, my, it's actually so interesting because 2011, 2012, I still wouldn't consider Facebook a big company. And certainly in 2009, I would not consider Facebook a big company. So what was the calculus going on in the company? Because you're basically inventing these really huge pieces of technology that are core and foundational. So why invent this huge risky thing, which you have to now maintain for years and years versus yeah. trying to outsource that or buy some technology? Well, the interesting thing is, I think I, I would definitely build Facebook very differently now uh, mm. than back then, right? The, the amount of software as a service or, uh, you know, AWS and all of these things that we're used to now just did not exist back then. We ran on physical servers. Um, you know, they were running at that time, Red Hat Linux, and uh, we would run these web servers on there directly. Uh, so the, the the virtual machines and all of these things came in way later uh, before they just ran on, on bare metal. Um, so back there, the, the real calculus was we were, we were running out of capacity. Um, Apache was just taking up too much compute power and too much memory to run efficiently for the amount we were serving. Hmm. Uh, so we were going to get, I don't remember the numbers, but, Originally, it was about five to ten x improvement on Apache PHP. Um, so, so you we, were getting a lot of improvement by changing from PHP into like you were converting the PHP essentially to be running on a C plus plus platform. Is that right? Yeah. So what it would do is it would take each PHP file, convert it to C plus plus code, mm. compile that code, mm. and ship binary. So PHP is an interpretive language. So when PHP runs on Apache server, it's interpreting the PHP mm -hmm. and it's converting it to bytecode. And you can cache the bytecode a little bit and do some fancy magic, uh, but it doesn't still give you the efficiency that a language like C++ would. Mm. And, but, and is the idea then that, so that totally makes sense that you want to eke out more performance gains by using a more performant language, a compiled yeah. language like C++. So why not just write the whole rewrite the whole site like was was it too far yeah. gone that now it's too late to migrate to java or c++ at that point that was definitely in discussion um mm. to re rewrite the entire site but the interesting thing is i think back then most of the front end was written in php before that it was written in Perl. um so python wasn't as popular yet uh there was some c sharp uh, going on, but really the, the predominant language in in that time frame was PHP, and we had, you know, hundred I don't remember how many lines, but like it's hundreds of thousands of lines of code uh, already written in PHP, and we had hundreds of engineers writing PHP. Hmm. Shifting the entire company over to a new language uh, would have been a much bigger challenge than the challenge we took on. You know, we, we ended up spending, you know, five engineers building for a couple of years and ended up with this language uh, hack. So it's, it, it wasn't the cost, the calculus just didn't add up. Mm. And I think the other interesting thing that I've seen in my experience at Facebook is how much value there is for engineering time. I, like what I heard you just, what, what I heard you say just, just now is that the ramp up time for all these thousands of engineers to stop doing PHP and ramp up on another language like, I don't know, Java or Python or whatever else it might've been, that would have been expensive as well. So it's not just the cost of rewriting everything, but the education time would have been quite expensive. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think engineer, you know, Facebook engineering is not shy about doing this if needed. So uh, in 2011, like we mentioned, um, iOS started becoming very popular. Android had just started. And we did shift uh, our engineering mindset, and our engineering uh, skill set over to mobile. Yeah. Um, we ended up starting uh, training for engineers who are very PHP and, uh, you know, some in even um, Java or C++ background 
into training them on how to build mobile apps because that's also a very different skill set yeah. mm-hmm. than writing uh, you know Java servlets and those types of technologies. Uh, so even though it's the same language, so we did make that shift uh, when when we needed to. But in the case of PHP to hip hop or PHP to you know later on hack, uh, it, the, the 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 calculus worked out in the favor of just doing this interpretive language and then uh, getting it uh, out. Uh, as a C++ binary. That makes sense. Um, so, okay, before we shift to the 2012 period where I think Facebook started to become a much more global company, you helped start the London office. I'll have like one or two more questions about this period. First, um, I'm curious, how did people think about the growth of the company? So I imagine back then, you know, right now in Silicon Valley, most large companies have a very structured performance review cycle. Every six months you get an evaluation. Back then, yeah. I don't think there was anything like that. So how did you manage your career growth and how did the engineering team think about, I'm gonna climb up the IC ladder and continue being an engineer versus being, becoming a manager? How did, how did those discussions happen back then? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So when I joined, obviously we didn't have any performance reviews or anything like that. Um, I didn't join for that. Right. I, I didn't join thinking, OK, I'm, I'm going to go become an engineering manager or you know, <laughs> do these things. I joined, like I mentioned, because of the interesting product and the interesting things they were building and the impact I could have, the experience I could bring to it and the experience I would have. So I was thinking much more on, around the lines of like, what can I learn more of? Um, so, you know, when that happened, I, I, I think the company went through this growth period right around you know when there were about a couple hundred engineers where when Mike uh, Shufford came in uh, he noticed that what we were doing is we were promoting really good engineers into a management role promoting because you know we don't do that anymore uh, so and what what ended up happening is these engineers who were really good at writing code and shipping product ended up having to manage people that they you know some people were good at it and you know they they did well but a lot of folks struggled at this because we didn't really have a formal training of you know here's how to be a good manager here's how to um, respond to uh, people's questions and here's how to grow people's careers here's how to think about career growth they just went okay we need we need managers let's promote this high performing engineer into management role uh, soon after Mike joined, what he did was he created uh, this track system where uh, we leveled engineers based on experience as also um, the role they played. So the higher the impact of your role, the higher the level you would have. And you know that dictated your salary and other things. And uh, he also created you know, a level of management uh, alongside and it was a parallel track it, it's not uh, something that uh, you get promoted into you transition into it so mm. uh, when you when you show signs that you do want to build people's careers you want to you know work with people and you want to help them get better uh, you personally decide to go into the management role instead of you know staying on the uh, individual contributor role where you stay much more technical and, you know, have, uh, you know, you write a lot more code as a manager, you probably won't, you probably will be helping, you know, connect your tech leads and your engineers to solutions that they're looking for. You unblock them and you really help them grow. So when he came in and did that, I think that really shifted the way the company grew and the way the company thought about management. And that led to a lot of different changes within the company including a lot more training for managers uh, and uh, bringing on uh, kind of that skill set that didn't exist before. You know, if you joined Facebook in 2006, 2007, 2008, and you stayed at the company, the ec- like the value of your equity at the company grew enormously. It's like if you stuck with it, it's like more than a 20, 30x increase, right? So I'm actually curious, how did that did that weigh on people? Like, did people join in the company think about, okay, Facebook is going to be a huge company one day and I know I'm going to be really wealthy and that somehow changes their attitude? Like, can you talk about that? Like, how did, 
um, the growth of Facebook and the valuation increase of Facebook impact the culture? Yeah, I could probably speak to my experience uh, more than others. Um, I did not join the company knowing that it would be this big. Mm -hmm. uh, I did not join the company for the the stock they gave me. It was it wasn't part of my calculus. Uh, I you know I actually did not even get a pay increase when I moved from Yahoo to Facebook because uh, back then Facebook was strapped on cash and they refused to give me more money. Um, but what I did was I said, fine, don't give me more money. Just give me more stock. I'll be fine with that. And it was, that was it was a very smart decision. <laughs> it was probably the best decision. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I do think maybe not because we didn't go IPO until, you know, after 2012. So before then, you couldn't sell anything. You could sell some in secondary markets and things like that. But a majority of the people, uh, didn't really care about their stock or what the valuation was um, until probably after the company went IPO. And that's when it, you could really see the difference come into play. And did that, like, how did people, it, it's a very interesting thing, right? Because if you join the company in 2013, 2012, you, you know, you have, you know, whatever equity package, which is a good compensation, but you're sitting next to someone in the office who literally, because they were at the company for four or five years prior to you, they have a huge, huge amount of, of ownership in the company, which is worth millions of dollars. So how did that, did that lead to any kind of interesting cultural differences or changes? Not in my experience. Uh, at least I've been fortunate enough to work with people who aren't you know, throwing that around. Yeah. Um, there's, there's an interesting, uh, metric that Facebook's internal tools have, which is, you know, the percentage of time you've been at the company or the percentage of com company that's newer than you. And when I left Facebook, uh, I was the 99.9th percentile, yeah. uh, of the company. Uh, so, you know, when you, when you, the, the reason for that is really just to show folk, folks how quickly the company was growing not to say, okay, this person is, you know, probably much better off than you are. <laughs> um, but, it, you know, I, I think the, the interesting part about that is, uh, you know, you, you did see a change in, you know, people upgrading their lifestyle. Like you would see them driving better cars. Uh, so the parking lot changed a little bit. Um, you would see them, you know, buying like the newest gadgets and things like that. But in general, I feel like, you know, it's definitely not like Hollywood where, you know, people are walking around with diamond, you know, necklaces and things like that. It just, it wasn't as flashy as uh, one would expect. Uh, and I think in general, Silicon Valley is fairly low key about how much wealth people have. Right. Can we now shift to London? So sure. you're in the Menlo Park headquarters for... Yeah the initial period since you joined Facebook in 2008, what led you to decide to go to move to London for a couple of years in 2012 and tell us about your experience in London? Yeah. So, um, it was interesting. So one of my friends, um, who was also, uh, my boot camp boot camper. So I, I mentored him when he first joined the company. Uh, he was uh, leading a team of engineers to go start the London office. And I, you know, I joked with him and I said, Hey, how, how do I get in on that deal? I want to travel. And, um, he said, you know what? I need a manager. Why don't you come on? Yeah. Why don't you come on with me? And I ended up being the first engineering manager there. Um, the decision was really for me was I really liked uh, well, I really like traveling, to be honest. But uh, I also like starting um, starting s small and also introducing the culture that I had. I I I I've, I'm really passionate about the engineering culture. You know, I've, I've given talks on this, uh, but I, you know, so that was one of the attraction pieces where I get to go help start a new office and build the culture and have an impact on that culture. And again, it comes back to having a wider impact 
And this was one of the ways to really help the company, right? Like, you know, you're starting a new site and you're helping it, you know, hopefully make it successful. And, you know, until then, we only had one other site in Seattle. I think we had one in New York, so that's not true. So two sites. Um, and London was going to be the farthest away one. And so it really needed a different mentality when it came down to it. Because you were, you were going to be eight hours away from the headquarters, uh, time zone wise. And so your entire day is offset. So, you know, when I was in London, when I was working there, I would be leaving as folks came into the office in Menlo Park. So we had to change the way we did our work. You know, engineering had to change its culture a little bit. And mm -hmm. that was the, the, uh, the part that attracted me to this, to this opportunity. So in London, was there a particular problem domain that Facebook wanted that site to work on? It sounds like for you, you were attracted to the cultural problem and how do you integrate London into the broader Facebook yeah. uh, team? What were, what were you working on? So uh, we ended up picking projects that people were already working on in Menlo Park. So when we landed in London, uh, I was working in infrastructure, so I started the infrastructure team there. Uh, so we ended up being a, a small remote team for the teams in Menlo Park. And over the next year to year and a, yeah, probably year, year and a half, uh, we tried this model of being a smaller team with working on parts of a project. And honestly, that was probably not working out as well as we thought it would have. Uh, and mainly because the culture in Menlo Park was, you know, I'm, I'm sure your audience has seen photos of our, you know, Facebook offices where everything is very open. Everyone sits at a desk and you always sit close to your team. You always have these, you know, conversations across uh, in real life rather than on email and, you know, in chat and other places where it gets recorded. Um, so the, the folks in London always were a step behind. Mm. Uh, so what we ended up doing is we ended up like noticing this, you know, after trying various things to help level the playing field. And we ended up deciding that we needed to bring an entire team to London uh, as a whole, right? Like where the, the, the center of gravity and the, the entire team is in London in one place working together. Uh, so uh, at that point in time, I was really fascinated by how, you know, Facebook's engineering culture and Facebook's company culture in general was driven by Facebook, the product, you know, like a lot of the communication that Facebook, the company was doing was on Facebook, the product. Mm -hmm. uh, it was just a different version of the product that most people didn't see. And when I was talking to, uh, you know, other engineers and I gave talks on this, uh, in fact, um, one of the, one of the directors of engineering from the Royal Bank of Scotland approached me after one of my talks and he said, Hey, could you, could you come give that talk at our company, please? And I was like, yeah, sure. Sounds good. Uh, and then, you know, went over to the Royal bank of Scotland's headquarters in London and then gave a talk. What I thought was going to be, you know, in a small meeting room with 10 people turned out to be in a jam packed, you know, meeting space with more than 120 people. Um, mm. And when I gave my talk, the leadership team there approached me and they said, Hey, we'd really like to figure out how to get that type of tooling and software communications wise uh, into our, into our company. Like, could, could you, could you build that for us at Facebook? And that kind of really sparked this idea uh, of we should be, you know, building a enterprise product for companies to use Facebook to communicate. Um, the interesting dynamic there is if you think about how Facebook is built, you know, when you post a picture, you own that picture. Hmm. When you write a post, you own that post. But when you work for a company, when you write a document, like the company owns it, right? And when you leave the company, you want to leave that behind. Hmm. So that really changes the dynamic of how Facebook the product is built. So the mm -hmm. underlying pinning of, you know, ownership of objects that needs to change. And so we ended up building uh, 
Back then, it was called Facebook at Work. Uh, these days, it's called Workplace, uh, yeah. which is Facebook's enterprise offering where as a company, you decide who's in the part of the company based on you know, Active Directory or uh, you know, any other single sign-on method. And uh, you can manage the content of that company for yourself. And it gives, it, you know, gives people a really familiar way to communicate uh, while still maintaining this, you know, the, the ownership uh, at, at a corporate level. I want to talk about bootcamp. So sure. I don't know, can you talk about what is bootcamp? And actually, did you start that process in London or was that after you had returned back to Menlo Park in 2014? Yeah, so a bootcamp uh, is a new hire engineering program. So what it does is it, at Facebook, there's an interesting concept where engineers are not hired into a particular team. They get hired into a general pool and then they get to select their team during the bootcamp process. So um, the process not only ramps you up uh, as an engineer, but get you used to our, the, the tooling that Facebook has, uh, the code base, the technology stack, uh, the engineering culture, uh, and a lot of these things, but it also helps you find the team that you want to go work for. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a, um, a selection process where you get to like choose from a menu of teams uh, that is very unique to Facebook. Um, so the bootcamp process existed in Menlo Park. And what, when we first got to London, we obviously did not have the, uh, the capacity to take on the bootcamp process. So what we ended up doing was having engineers come to Menlo Park for four weeks and do the bootcamp process here. Mm. Uh, and then come to London for the last two weeks or roughly the two weeks of bootcamp. So bootcamp is usually around like six weeks but it could take longer depending on the person and what teams they're looking at. Uh, so uh, that process was very painful for the folks who started joining our teams in London because some of them had families that they couldn't leave for four weeks. Um, so we ended up expediting the need for boot camp in London. So I started that process and I started training folks in London itself. Um, and then when I did come to Menlo Park uh, in 2014, uh, towards the end of the year, I took over the process from uh, my other friend, Wayne, uh, for the entire company. So I did boot camp for you know, all, all the sites that we had, including mm. Tel Aviv, London, New York, uh, and Seattle. So yeah. I think what I'm really interested in is you've probably seen hundreds or maybe even thousands of engineers who have gone through bootcamp and they're onboarding into Facebook culture, tooling, code base, right? What lesson or what insight can you share about what makes, what is effective uh, for a new engineer to ramp up in a company? Yeah, um, definitely. I've, I've definitely seen more than a few thousand come through the program when I was, uh, when I was there. Um, I ran or I, I was part of a few different roles. First, I was a mentor. Then I helped start kickstart the program in London. I also mentored other mentors at the same time. Uh, and so I was a mentor of mentors. And then I eventually, you know, uh, did uh, run the program itself. And the program had evolved, you know, even so I, m one of my last things I did on the bootcamp program was uh, ship the version three of the program uh, to really remap the classes and, uh, you know, change with the engineering landscape. So the bootcamp program uh, is always evolving. And I, I think the, the, the best advice I could give is to really go into bootcamp with an open mindset, right? Like, you know, when you join Facebook, I, I've, I've probably talked to a few dozen candidates who are very nervous about coming into a company uh, without a team to go land into. Um, and they didn't know what that outcome would be, right? Like, am I going to, uh, you know, like what I work on or like the product or, you know, like the project? And it's, while it is nervous, I, uh, you know, I, I think the interesting piece here is that they get to spend a lot more time with each and every team uh, than they would in an interview. 
Mm. Right. So going back to our earlier discussion about like how do you, you know, get a sense of how good the team is or how well you work with them. Uh, I think Facebook has solved that problem through bootcamp. Mm. So it creates this process where engineers come in and they really spend uh, weeks working with potential teams that they are, are looking at and getting to know the manager, getting to know the teammates, getting to know the tech lead, getting to know the engineering culture, what in even the code base, right? And the type of work they do. And once that happens, I think you, you get to select and you know, you have a choice there. So naturally I think people are just more passionate at the end of the process because they're really invested in their team that they selected. Right. And mm. I think it, it makes for a better engineering experience, ramp up experience, as well as long term uh, kind of morale uh, for the engineer coming through. What Facebook really wants you to do is have impact, which is true. Like, you know, like we want all employees to have impact. And, um, and that's true for my work currently at CZI. You know, we want everyone to have an impact. Like, there's been, but it doesn't have to be through hard work. It doesn't have to be through long hours. It could be by working efficiently. And a, a really good way to illustrate this example is, let's say you're straight out of college and, you know, I, I think there's an upper bound to how much code you can write, right? Like you can't type any faster than you can type. And even if you're a fast typer, I don't think you can produce a whole ton of code. Um, so for an engineer, from if you're comparing a new grad engineer to say a, a VP level engineer, right? Like a very, very senior engineer, they're not writing hundred times the amount of code that a new grad engineer is writing. They're probably not even writing half the code that the new grad engineer is writing, but they're doing it much more efficiently. Mm. The reason they, that, that they're at that position is because they are using their experience. They're using their intuition. They're using their um, knowledge of the system to work much more efficiently and avoid pitfalls. And, you know, I don't want to stereotype here, but like what I've, you know, I know that was the case in, that was uh, true in my case is when I first started, I struggled a lot with debugging very silly things and, you know, ended up spending countless hours like going, okay, this compiler is complaining. I don't know what it's talking about. And, or, you know, I'm, I must have missed a pointer somewhere and, you know, I'm leaking memory or whatnot. Uh, this is C++. Um, yeah. And, you know, like later on in life, I feel like those problems are mostly reduced, right? Like I, I, I build this instinct on, oh, I've, I know what this is. I know how to fix this or I know how to avoid it in the first place. I'll build a framework that lets me, you know, not make the silly mistakes that I used to. Hmm. Uh, and I think that's, you know, and, and if, I, you know, I was, I was a smart enough engineer, I could figure out how to build this framework for the whole company. So I save everyone time. And like, that's how I have impact. And so I, I think that's, it's, it's a common misconception. I feel that you have to work really hard to get promoted and to do well in your career. Um, I think the, the, the biggest thing I've found is to really focus on uh, how to work more efficiently, how to make use and really restrict yourself to a, a set of hours. And that could change based on where you are in your life. So, and I, and I tend to practice this myself. I, you know, I do restrict myself. I don't try to work insane amount of hours. I do try to spend time with my family and kids. And you know, when I was younger and I, you know, felt like I had more time because I had less responsibilities and less other things to do, I did spend a lot more time working. Mm. Yeah, that, I, I think that's a good way of framing it. It's basically that you don't get promoted by putting in more and more hours. You get promoted by having a wider and wider influence. And that doesn't necessarily correlate with lines of code or number of hours that you put in. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, and we look for, as engineering managers, uh, we do look for that, you know, when we promote folks, how sustainable is this? Because if a person is working 130% of their normal sustainable capacity, mm. they're going to end up just burning out. and quitting. Yeah. 
that's a really good point. So in, in some ways, if someone is having to work 80 hours a week in order to produce impact at the next level, that's almost in some ways a bad thing. Like that's a yeah. signal they shouldn't get promoted because they yeah. won't be able to operate that, that way for too long. Yeah. And I, I have held folks back from promotions for doing exactly that. And that's oh. the feedback I give them. And I said, thank you for doing this work. You're doing amazing work. But guess what? It's not sustainable. Mm. And I don't want you to be working night and you know, day to get this work done. Because if I promote you, you're going to end up just, you're going to have to keep working that hard. And you're going to end up on the wrong side of what, what I want you to do, which is get better at producing that same amount of work and get quicker at finding issues or get better at automating things or writing frameworks or whatnot and uh, just essentially get become more efficient. I want to talk about recruiting at like sure. the period before bootcamp. How do you get into Facebook? But before we do that, is there anything you want to point out or talk about from your, from that era of Facebook between 2014 and 2019? Yeah. I, I think um, at least in my experience, Facebook did go through uh, a very big transformation that, you know, before, before that, Facebook was very focused around one product, one product only. And in 2014, um, I think they, they ended up buying Instagram and, you know, later on buying WhatsApp. And after that, Oculus and started a whole hardware division. And I think that also transformed the company quite differently because Facebook was no longer just a pure, you know, mobile app and web apps company anymore. Totally. Um, they started diving into other things and uh yeah it's it's that was that was part of the one of the reasons why i joined the portal team where you know it was it was a a little different change and i I really wanted to bring i wanted to learn about hardware because i've never done it and by the way can you just quickly give the pitch what is portal uh portal is um a device that helps you connect people over video chat and the 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 standout, you know, feature of Portal is it has this camera that's very smart and can track people and like really brings you closer to them. Um, and one of the, that was one of the biggest things that attracted me to Portal too. Uh, the project was because when I was in London, and my parents are here in California, and I wanted them to be closer to my kid, uh, and you know, so we ended up doing a lot of uh, video chats um on you know the ipad and the desktop and things like that and you know if you know anything about babies they don't like to sit still and so he would just be running around all over the place and so you know i was i was always having to reposition things and like move the ipad around to follow him so that you know they, they they could talk to um talk to him and get you know my parents could talk to him and i think the concept of the portal really uh, jumped at me when I first heard about it and I saw it and I needed to be part of it uh, because it, it does that for you. And mm. it's really designed for families and it's designed for a people uh, very different from a conference uh, call at work, right? And it's very different from a video conference room because this is something you bring into your home and it has a different um, type of, uh, interface to it to really help you connect with family. Yeah. Yeah. And so what I'm hearing you say is that with the introduction of products like portal, the acquisition of Oculus, WhatsApp, Instagram, and there's probably a, a bunch of other products that a lot of people haven't even heard about, but basically Facebook went from a single product in the early days, 2011, 2012 to now having a whole suite of many products so how has that impacted has that impacted the cohesion of the company i'm sure it has right to some extent yeah how has it impacted the culture and, and things like that i you know the, the 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 good news here is we have a singular boot camp program still right facebook mm-hmm. still has a singular boot camp program and uh that still brings some sort of unity even across these diverse products um, there is still engineering mobility within each of these products. So you can go from the Facebook app to Instagram or to WhatsApp. 
And so that really keeps uh, things a little bit more blended than siloed. I think that's one of the key things that um, larger companies really miss the mark on. Because once you join a very big company, you end up working on this product and you end up working on it for 10, 20 years. Um, whereas a Facebook engineer tends to move around quite a lot. Mm. Like I had probably in my 11 years gone through, uh, you know, a dozen teams. I want to also talk about recruiting because obviously you did boot camp, but at the same time, you've been heavily involved with interviewing people and recruiting. And in fact, yeah. when I was, when we were having, when I was having that debate between Snapchat and Facebook, I remember you were calling me while you were on the way to the airport to go to Australia, I think, because you were going to lead some interview process or hackathon that was happening in Australia. So yeah. can you tell us what, uh, what wisdom you have about interviewing at Facebook or just more broadly interviewing in general? Yeah, um, I can give you a brief history of what, what I did at Facebook in terms of recruiting. I probably started recruiting for Facebook very heavily in 2009. Um, and by 2010 or so, I started doing international recruiting trips. Um, and my primary area that I went to uh, go recruit at was in India. So I, uh, I was familiar with the with the culture and you know, it was pretty easy. And you know, it gave me an excuse to go see my grandma. Uh, so I ended up doing about two trips a year, every year to India, uh, whether it was to give technical talks. You know, I, I gave uh, a few talks at uh, IITs and other universities there, um, and also to industry uh, candidates and also recruiting. It's really interesting hiring internationally. Uh, including in India, because I, I do think there's a cultural difference when it comes to uh, recruiting folks from there. And, uh, you know, based on my experience, I could, I could, you know, compensate for that. Uh, so uh, uh, there's, there's a lot of um, interesting differences, like, you know, like you mentioned earlier, like we were talking about earlier, where, um, you know, people get promoted uh, based on you know, based on their seniority or uh, based on kind of like, are, are they good or not? And they kind of get promoted into a management role, which leads to uh, very weird cultural changes um, inside companies. And in India, I, I felt that it was very prominent uh, where um, the lower engineers were being told exactly what to go to, hmm. right? You, you would, you know, when we interview folks out of, uh, you know, out of the industry where they have a few years experience under their belt, we're really starting to look for independence. Like, can you take a project? Can you break it down into tasks? Can you go ship this thing or feature or whatever it is on your own? Right. And then the next level there is, can you do it with a team? Can you delegate the work that you have to other people and bring them along and mm. deliver something as a team? And, in India, I started noticing that there was a trend where people would do poorly at this, th this part of the interview, where we would look for independence in their current work. Um, and, you know, I, I, I gave a talk in India at Flipkart about this a little bit as well. Um, and I, I hope the culture has changed. I, have, I, haven't, I haven't checked up on it, but uh, I think, you know, Flipkart in India is one of those companies that has adopted this this uh, new way of thinking where they want to give more independence to, to the individual engineer. And definitely, you know, when you're straight out of college, you're going to need help. You know, you need a good mentor, you need someone to tell you kind of how to do things. But soon after that, you know, after a year or two, you know, the expectation is like, you're much more independent and you're, yeah. you're getting and, things done by yourself. And it sounds like, so you're looking for a signal about independence and being able to kind of own something which is different from being able to solve a coding problem on the whiteboard or doing leak code right so what 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 questions are you asking to get that signal that you're looking for um you end up asking a lot of different questions to get that signal um it's it definitely takes uh some experience to get that signal out it's not you know something you can just solve for because again humans respond in a different way right? Based on your culture, based on your gender, based on, 
you know, the industry you work in, all of those factor into how you respond to something. Mm. Um, so for example, uh, folks right out of the military respond to a question very differently than someone who, you know, graduated out of a top university and went to a company like Facebook, where it's very open and not hierarchical at all. Mm. Right. And so I think you have to compensate and you have to view it from that lens. Um, and yeah, and absolutely. I, I think, I think it's, it's actually bad practice to just base a candidate's performance on interview alone or on the coding interview alone, right? Like just technical prowess or, you know, them being able to solve a problem uh, in a record time does not mean they'll be a good engineer. Uh, Sure, it helps, like they can do this, but I've seen folks who are not as quick, who solve things slower than, you know, your, your top elite coders, uh, but are much more successful engineers because they can ship things really uh, like well-built things that are shipped on time, right? Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, we, you have to take the entire person and how they fit in with your organization. Um, so if you're a small startup and you need someone to be really flexible and move very fast and be very, uh, you know, um, scrappy, I think that's a different profile than if you're programming for something like SpaceX, where, you know, every line of code could lead to a disastrous event. Yeah. Move fast uh, and break things doesn't work well at SpaceX. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, you know, so I, I, I think that interview process needs to change based on the role you're hiring for. Yeah. Um, and also, yeah, I, I, you know, while I encourage people to go knock the rust off by doing a hacker rank or elite code style interviewing questions, uh, that alone will not get you a job, right? Like mm. that's not going to be, uh, that's going to be part of your interview and hopefully you do well at that. But what you really want to, you know, the thing that I'm looking for is how do you respond to situations? How, you know, how do you deal with conflict? How do you deal with, uh, when you notice that, someone is telling you to do something that you're like, I don't think that's a good idea. Right. And can you, are you that person who can start saying, hang on, I don't think that's a good idea. Here's a better solution. Mm. Right. Cause that's the engineer you want. And how do you, how do you cultivate that? I mean, so like there's one aspect, which is the independence part. Um, I imagine like that you could maybe tell people go and work on a side project and build something out on your own. And for these kind of questions, what practical advice can you tell people Here's what you can do in order to prepare for that conversation. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of it is you can't prepare for it. I think you just have to speak honestly about your experience, including the failures, right? Mm-hmm. And, and, and take away what you learn, right? So, for example, let's say, you know, be open about it. You know, when, when I ask, um, you know, a question like talk about a time where, you know, your peer didn't agree with something you did. And I don't want you to come up with a time where uh, you beat your peer into submission to accept your response. Like that's not, uh, you know, a good trait either, right? Like to force someone to like see your perspective. What I really want to see is how did you compromise? How did you try to see their perspective? What, What did you do to put yourself in their shoes to really understand the situation and how did you react to that? Whether, you know, you won out of that argument or you lost, doesn't matter, right? I do, like, that's not the, the signal I'm looking for. I'm not looking for people who are always right. I'm looking for people who can learn, mm. uh, people who can adapt and people who can, uh, you know, be transparent about their failures and successes. Yeah. So I, I think I think that's probably the, the the biggest thing to go into an interview with is to be, um, you know, being open to being wrong and talking about where you were wrong and you know what you've learned from it. Yeah, I'd like to bring this actually back to what we talked about initially, which is your current profile, your current role at Chan Zuckerberg Initiative. Can you talk about as a lead of a huge of a very large team at Chan Zuckerberg? 
Um, are the things that you look for in an interview, are they different at all compared to what you were looking for at Facebook? Yeah, I, I do think they're different. Um, you know, we are a very different type of company, right? Uh, so we really want people who believe in, in that cause of helping humanity. Uh, so that's one of the signals we definitely look for. Like, why are you here? Mm. Because, you know, we're, we're a philanthropy. We, we're, there's no chance that we're going to go public and, you know, we don't give out stock options. You know, none of those factors exist. So the people who pick us, who want to be here, are usually folks who are very, um, you know, uh, in tune with helping humanity in general. So uh, we end up having those people come to us anyway, but also we look for what are the reasons they're joining us. Um, in addition to all the other things I talked about. Um, the other interesting thing about my team is specifically is we're a fairly uh, senior team because we end up helping and um, working with so many different teams across the company. So I tend to look for a lot more independence in my, uh, my team than I normally would have had I been working on a smaller product team. Uh, so I think that, that also changes. And like I mentioned, I think it, it really depends on the, tri the role you're trying to fill and the team you're trying to build that you have to take into account as you're uh, building your team. Go and for people who may not have the ability right now to go work at CZI, because I think CZI is California based in the Bay Area. Do you have any thoughts or advice on if I'm in the middle of the country, I'm in India or I'm somewhere else in the world, do you have any advice for what I can do right now in order to really help some of these really noble causes with my tech background? Yeah, for sure. Um, so we are hiring across the US. So okay, cool. uh, come apply even, even if you're not in California. Um, but yeah, we are based in Redwood City, so we're mostly here. Um, I, you know, the interesting piece about my team or CCI in general is we obviously don't make any money, so we're not selling products. So my team ends up building a lot of open source technology and tooling. Mm -hmm. So if you go to our GitHub repository or GitHub account, for example, um, we'll have many. Uh, I think it's over a hundred or something open source repositories in there. Um, and we contribute a lot of the work we do uh, on the open source uh, repositories. So if you're, if you can't be part of a company like CZI, I do think there's a lot of other nonprofits that do have opportunity where you can contribute uh, in the open source space. And, um, you know, and, this advice I would give in general anyway, because I, I think, you know, as part of even the interview process, I do look at how uh, the potential candidates have contributed on the open source side. And it gives me a lot more insight to look at their GitHub commits um, than a, a technical coding challenge, right? Because like, you're, you're seeing them, how they build their test plans. You're seeing how they uh, explain what the problem is to the other open source contributors mm -hmm. uh, and really, you know, even uh, have a conversation about it and how they approach the problem, how they, uh, how they resolve conflicts and other things. And I'm not talking about code conflicts. I'm talking about, you know, design pattern conflicts and other, you know, things that are much uh, more impactful when it comes to working in a team. Mm -hmm. And if you could do that on open source uh, repositories, that would be a really big signal to the hiring manager that you have that maturity, you have that uh, ability to c bring people along with you rather than just go work on a project on your own. Yeah, Grish, this has been really illuminating for me, being able to kind of hear about your unique journey. You're one of the few people I know who has been at Facebook for so long. And I think the work you're doing at CZI is really incredible. And I think that the fact that you're chose to spend your time and your talent at a place like CCI is, is pretty, uh, really impressive. What else do you want to share before we wrap up? I, I, I was, I was watching your, uh, interview with Igor the other day and, 
I, I think he had really good advice that I almost want to echo, uh, which was like, you know, for your audience who are looking for their next career change or looking for a career, uh, really find something that drives them, that they're passionate about. Because I see so many people um, kind of just going after either uh, the uh, the name brand of the company or uh, the, the the title um, and uh, maybe even the paycheck, but they don't really think about what it would be like for them, what would make them happy um, and what they could learn from it, right? Like, so shifting that conversation a little bit to, you know, can I, am I going to be a person who's going to just get the job done and get out of there and that's my role? Or am I going to be going into work and looking forward to work and, you know, really be excited about it? And I think that not only makes you a better employee, but actually helps you grow your career faster. Hmm. Uh, because the, the more passionate you are, the more invested you are, uh, the, bo- the better your work quality will just be. I love that. If people want to learn more about your journey or maybe have the chance to connect with you, Grish, where could they do that? Sure. Um, I'm happily accepting uh, messages on LinkedIn. If you have any questions, just just send me a message and I'll try to respond. Perfect. I'll leave a link to your LinkedIn in the description for the video. So if anyone wants right. to follow up on that, they have that. Too. Thanks again, Grish. I think this is super helpful for me and I think helpful for a lot of people. Yeah, it was great talking to you again. Yeah.